the gut microbiome, by about two years old, your little toddler, they've got a kind of an adult ready to go micro, an established, they're not mature, but their gut is matured. It's developed, you know, the, the gut when we're born is sterile, right? We get our first swab of it when passing through the mom's vagina, the baby will ingest bacteria and fungus and so forth, and that starts supplanting it. And then it just starts developing over time. And by two, it's kind of a stable, mature microbiome. Now, whether the child was breastfed or bottle fed, that affects the microbiome. Whether they got antibiotics as infants, that affects the microbiome. And many things even affected in infancy. Now, I just listed out some, you know, the most common bacteria. Now, a couple of them you'll probably recommend, you know, you'll see bifidobacterium, lactobacillus. These are at the top of what we call our beneficial bacteria. And anybody who's ever bought a bottle of probiotics, those are by far the main species of bacteria that we use as probiotics, right? And then there are many common fungi. Obviously, the candida species, maybe you've heard of that. If you've been in integrative medicine, physicians, you know, just overgrowing candida, or we're, we can measure this on stool samples. So these are the most common. You can see also what I wrote, 60% of dry feces. Now, most of us don't take our feces out of the toilet, dry it, and, you know, and just, you know, that's not something, a really very typical thing. But if you did that, most of it is bacteria. So... The gut microbiome, okay, I've said it's beneficial. How is it beneficial? Well, it does help us digest food. In fact, it's very interesting. When you make any kind of significant dietary change, within two to three days, you're going to start developing or growing different bacteria. Meat eaters have different bacteria in their gut than vegetarians, right? And if a vegetarian... All of a sudden, you know, they're a vegan and they're like, wow, I'm really tired of being anemic all the time. So I think I'm just going to start eating meat. And they just have a steak that is not going to digest well. Now, it won't digest well because they don't have digestive enzymes to break it down because we make enzymes based on the foods that we make. But also, we don't have a microbiome that is supporting that food. And that helps us digest food. Just as if some one of you doing keto decided, eh, you know what, let's just have a bowl of beans. That is not going to work. Uh, you know, you'll just be floating off the ground with a, with a gas production. You don't have any right microbiome to really help you digest that, right? So, so we, but our, really, it changes based really in days on what we eat, okay? And it produces certain nutrients. You can see we make a lot of vitamin K in our gastrointestinal tract. Our bacteria do it. Our only real food source for vitamin K is green leafy vegetables. If you're not doing those a lot and you've had a lot of antibiotics or GMO foods or other damage to your gut, you may not make vitamin D or vitamin K. And you may have osteoporosis, osteopenia, but you're like, but I, I have good vitamin D levels. What's the matter? Well, vitamin K takes the calcium and puts it into your bone. Vitamin D just helps your intestines, help you absorb it from the intestine. To get it into the bone is vitamin K. You need a healthy microbiome to be making that nutrient, right? Also, you can see the other ones, uh, antioxidants. A lot of antioxidants have to be activated by the microbiome before they're going to be usable in the body as that antioxidant. Detoxification, right? So honestly, we break a lot of things down we, and we can help detoxify what's in our gastrointestinal tract through the microbiome. We're gonna, the short chain fatty acids, I'm gonna focus on that in the, in the next, that's a key thing of what I'm talking about today. So I'm gonna go over those in a second. Our immune system, you know, the largest part of your immune system is in your gut. Secretory IgA is the largest aspect of our immune system and it is in the gut to protect the gut from pathogens. 
that we, because we eat food, it's in the environment, there's bad bugs, etc. We eat those and we've got a stomach acid and we've got an immune system to help fight that off as well as, of course, things like cooking food. But this is a huge immune system that's in our system. And the healthier the microbiome, the healthier the, the, the gut is less inflamed, the mucus lining is better, and the immune system is stronger. And that's where we get the pathogens. Has anybody here ever had food poisoning? Yeah, I mean, we don't want that all the time. <laughs> that is not a good thing, right? So the, part, our immune system is there designed to deal with those bugs that get in. Obviously, sometimes we're overwhelmed, but it works very efficiently. And then the barrier, right? The gut bacteria, you know, they, uh, by their anti-inflammatory amount, they also, you know, part of the pathogens is keeping down bacteria in our own gut that can overgrow. We have candida. We have many different candida species in our gut, right? And they can overgrow. So beneficial bacteria, you can kind of look at them as cops on the block, right? If there's no cops, then, you know, kind of the thieves are going to start coming out and the, the society, it's going to break down a little bit. We're going to see elements of society that wouldn't be there if there was regular policemen, say. And that's what the beneficial bacteria do. They keep, you have C. difficile in your gut right now, but it isn't overgrowing, producing toxins and giving you that antibiotic, you know, giving that generally post antibiotic uh, diarrhea. But it could, but it's not because that's what the beneficial bacteria are doing. They're going around saying, we're going to be diverse, we're going to be prolific, and we're going to keep an eye on everything going on here, right? And some of these bacteria, gram negative bacteria, can make what we call lipopolysaccharides. Those are what we also call endotoxins. And those can get into the human body and cause damage in the body. Our, we, can have, we can have cells in our gut making tumor necrosis factor alpha, very pro-inflammatory. That can go to the liver and start causing inflammation called non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, kind of fatty liver that's caught fire. Tumor necrosis factor alpha is our number one inflammatory marker that goes to our cells, like our muscle cells, our fat cells, and says, why don't you become insulin resistant? Why don't you not let glucose into your cells? So that the, and then they'll become a pre-diabetic or diabetic. That's okay. But that comes from the gut. That can come from the gut. With a healthy microbiome, at keeping everything down, keeping the inflammation down, it's preventing a lot of these things from entering our body, right? So that's the systemic functioning. It's, it, by its regulation, we have just nutrients going through the gut but not a lot of other things that are gonna cause problems. So how do we test the microbiome? Well, a diet diary, do you think someone eating, you know, a whole foods, good diet, you know, meat, veggies, might have a healthier microbiome than someone eating Snickers, Coke, and McDonald's, right? I mean, this is very common sense, right? So. But we do, I do a diet diary with everybody just to check them out. We can do stool analyses. You can read, you know, we can do other breath tests to see if there's small intestine bacterial overgrowth. There's a lot of ways to check to see, is it healthy? Or if it's unhealthy, how is it unhealthy? Because we can really balance and correct any problem we see in the gastrointestinal tract. Now, these are the things that harm the microbiome, right? Diets, right? Obviously bad diets, but a low-carb diet can be bad to the gut. Now, it doesn't have to be, and I'm going to talk about how to make it not that way, right? We can have a very healthy, obviously, ketogenic diet that's awesome for the gut. But if we're not paying attention, it could, and there are studies we're going to go over in a second that will show it can be harmful to the gut, right? So um, babies, obviously, having a, if they have a C-section, they didn't get that mouthful of vaginal bacteria and fungus to get them inoculated, right? So uh, you can see the rest antibiotics. Of course, I mean, the top worst drugs for the microbiome, right? Antibiotics, but proton pump inhibitors. 
for sure, science shows that proton pump inhibitors, which decrease stomach acid production by like 98%, literally will change the microbiome. And people have a much higher risk of getting food poisoning, for example, not just because the stomach acid won't be killing bacteria, which is one of its factors, but also there isn't such a good microbiome to ward off. We have less COPs because we've had negative changes to the microbiome because of the PPIs, right? NSAIDs. NSAIDs are a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. This is ibuprofen, naproxen, aspirin, and pharmaceutical ones that, you know, stronger ones that we write scripts for. These are devastatingly damaging to the gut lining, devastatingly. In a half, they cause leaky gut, they break down the mucus lining in the gut. NSAIDs are the number one reason that we see people ha can have recurrent diverticulitis because they're so pro-inflammatory to the gastrointestinal tract. So these are really bad drugs. And if you're on these regularly, you do wanna see a physician who might work with your pain in a different way and try to get you off of these drugs. GMOs, I mean, everybody knows what those mean, right? Genetically modified organism, corn, soy, cane sugar, et cetera. Uh, food poisoning, and then you can see just obesity, so inflammatory, really negative changes to the microbiome, um, but very correctable, very correctable. Uh, and then you can see the others, food sensitivities related to intestinal permeability, and then just general, somehow you got whacked out in your basic healthy microbiome. So these are all things that can be a problem. Now, what about the diet, right? So a health, this is with, you know, um, I saw a documentary that said there's different bacteria love different foods. And there was even one bacteria that loved kiwi. I mean, kiwi, let alone others like chicken or others like, you know, lettuce or whatever. The, the key with diet, no matter what kind of diet you're doing, is diversity. And in ketogenic or in other therapeutic diets, it can be very common for people to eat the same meal every day. This is my breakfast. You know, this is what I do every day. Your gut doesn't like that. And as we see, there's a great cookbook out there for sale on ketogenic recipes. Uh, the more that we get, just have some simple recipes and get variety in, the more we get food variety, we will have a healthier microbiome. We will have a much more diverse, you know what they say with forests, right? Now, having a forest just of one kind of tree makes that forest much more susceptible to be eradicated by blight, by insects, and it has less capacity to even survive a forest fire versus the forests that are just full of different kind of trees is a healthier forest microbiome, right? And the same with the gut. So one thing we are looking at with the keto is, are you really not just having, you know, eggs and bacon every day or your, you know, your bulletproof coffee every day or this, you know, protein powder smoothie every day? Now, maybe you have it, maybe you use different vegetables, maybe you do a different protein, maybe you're just changing it up a little bit that we just get diversity through it to keep that microbiome uh, as varied as it can be, right? So dietary that excludes certain food products can narrow the microbiome, right? So that's why what we are choosing to eat because it's awesome for our health and it's helping us be healthy and maintain our health. And those levels of foods, variety must take place, right? So as I said, as little as three days, it can change. So one of the best things for sure for the, I mean, there's many good things for the microbiome. One is don't put garbage in it, right? I mean, don't put drugs in it. Don't put PPIs, don't put NSAIDs, don't put, antibiotics, I mean, unless of course things are absolutely necessary, right? Uh, don't eat GMO foods, don't eat junk food, don't eat sugar, you know, etc. But the other thing is what are you putting in it to make it healthier? Fiber, right? So 
And you can have fermentable fiber fully on a, low, on, a, on a ketogenic diet, right? So we're not saying get off the diet. We're saying, no, stay on the diet. But are you really getting in these fibers that will really maintain your microbiome, right? Uh, now, the other thing is these oligosaccharides. Um, you may see on some probiotics, they'll have fructo oligosaccharides or galacto oligosaccharides. So probiotics are beneficial bacteria that are in our gut, there are certain species, and why they don't colonize in our gut, they do an amazing amount of things. But the food for them is these sac oligosaccharides. So that's why they add them in. You'll see the FOS or inulin or galacto oligosaccharides as food for the probiotics, but they're food for our beneficial bacteria too. Those probiotics are bugs in our gut. So this is what, if you're not going to actually eat the fiber, having a supplement that has one of these oligosaccharides is also a benefit. So good diet. Now, out of the sh so sh why do we need the fiber? This is where I'm getting into the short chain fatty acids. So short chain fatty acids, what we have is we eat fiber and then we have beneficial bacteria and then these eat these and ferment them and they turn them into short-chain fatty acids. And these are the food of the colon cells. Low in short-chain fatty acids, you have an increased risk of developing colon cancer, right? This is pretty serious. These are, this is the food of the colon cells. This is what they eat. So we want to make sure we are getting these made in our intestinal tract through this diet, right? Now, there are three main ones, butyrate, acetate, propionate. The really beneficial one is butyrate. Uh, that's the most, about 60% is usually butyrate. If we're low in butyrate and get high in propionate, that can be a problem. We could talk about that some other time, like Parkinson's and, and uh, even autism are associated with higher levels of propionate in the brain. So we want to really make sure we get enough fiber to make that really beneficial one, the butyrate. Uh, now, you can see that a few fiber, excuse me, a few protein amino acids isoleucine, leucine, and valine, which we call the branch chain fat, you know, the branch chain of, <clears throat> uh, amino acids can also make some of these short chain fatty acids. But this is only 5% of short chain fatty acids are made from the proteins, right? So it really is the fiber. So this is what I said, the short chain fatty acids. Now, short chain fatty acids, they get, they feed the colon, but they get absorbed by the, the intestinal tract as well. They're anti-inflammatory. They help regulate metabolism, energy, glucose. They can help reduce insulin resistance. They are very beneficial in the gut and outside, like anything related to the gut. If it's good for the gut, it is good for your body. It's good for your brain, right? So you can see, I just listed a few things that short chain fatty acids do, uh, blocking ghrelin, right? Ghrelin, you know, we've got leptin, kind of lose weight, ghrelin, gain weight, right? So ghrelin stimulates our, uh, our desire to eat. And short chain fatty acids help the body keep that down. Right, so helping with appetite control and so forth. So these are really beneficial for us. Now, so fiber, as you can see, increases bacterial abundance, increases the two, two of our main ba beneficial bacteria, the bifidobacterium and the lactobacillus species, and the short chain fatty acid bacterium, uh, ruminococcus, rosabiria, uh, fusa. Uh, there's another one that's got a really long pseudofusilanum, is, but I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, so there are some bacteria species specifically that make more short chain fatty acids. Now, as we said, this is, you know, it's helping with the production of short chain fatty acids. Fiber also, you know, does other things. It's detoxification. Uh, it does, since it feeds the microbiome, they'll be happier and more diverse and more prolific. It also helps us with antioxidant production. Everything is really tied together. Now, 
A low fiber diet may cause depletion of gut bacteria over generations. Now, this is a mouse study. And you know what? In reality, all animal studies do not really equate to all, you know, humans in general. But this isn't the, there are many studies, I have other ones, that show a lower carb diet can negatively affect the microbiome in these mice. Now, these mice eat a high fiber diet as a general rule, so it's, that's their native diet. But they put, what they did, they can create mice that are sterile, and then they implant human bacteria into them, like a fecal microbiotic transplant with a very small tube. Ah. So what they saw is that on feeding these mice a low carb diet, their microbiome lost a lot of diversity. Now when they fed the fiber back in, it regained. But when they fed one set of mouse low carb, and then their kids low carb, and then their kids low carb, then they fed them fiber, they could not recover the microbiome. There had been a, like a, a genetic permanent change that that microbiome could not respond, right? So uh, now in, uh, in this one, um, uh, you know, this again, just eating ridiculous amounts of fiber in a bar, you know, caused weight loss, lower BMI, yep, thanks. So, um, so it's lower fiber. We also have that reduced mucus layer. A reduced mucus layer, you know, the gut lining, the small gut lining is one cell thick. One cell. Because it can't have anything blocking us absorbing all these, our nutrients, our vitamins, our minerals, right? All of our, our, our protein, our amino acids. So, and on top of it is that layer of mucus that helps protect it, keeps the beneficial bacteria. Some live in that mucus. And so if we lose that mucus, those cells are much more susceptible to inflammatory changes and, and breaking down, developing leaky gut. Now, what about ketogenic diet specifically? Well, if you're just on a ketogenic diet as it is, yes, you are going to lose the bacteria, you're gonna have lower bacteria that make the short chain fatty acids, right? And you can also increase other bacteria that can be problematic, right? Ca you know, causing irritable bowel or actually working against us losing weight and against us getting our blood sugar under control, right? So obviously, there's, well, let's fix that, right? So there's no, so we need, so as me working with patients on low carb, on ketogenic, I am very, uh, you know, very strongly and recommending they do get fiber in, not high carb foods with fiber, but ketogenic foods with fiber and fiber supplements, right? So this is to me bringing this win-win together. We get this awesome diet that's doing so much good, but then we're really putting in specifically what the microbiome needs to maintain its health long-term. Very win-win. Now fiber, right, is carbohydrates that are not broken down, they're not absorbed. Right, so they're they're being not by the we're not getting them in. It's for the microbiome. You can see the standard, you know, regular, you know, amount is men getting thirty eight grams and women twenty five, etc. Right, these are standard amounts of fiber we're supposed to get in. Uh, again, talking about the kind of things that it does in the human uh, gut. Now there are soluble fiber which is fermentable to short chain fatty acids and insoluble, which we use a lot to help form our stools, have good bowel movements. I don't know some of you, some of my patients can get a little constipated sometimes on the diet. Adding in these fibers really just takes care of that uh, very handily for them. Now, on a keto diet, you can see foods that have fermentable fiber. Brussels sprouts, avocado, broccoli, ground flax seeds, nuts and seeds in general, artichokes, right? And then we can add 
other then I have supplements that people can do, right? It's eat, you know, chia seeds, guar gum, inulin. Inulin is in those probiotics, right? So these are things that are easy to get in for soluble and insoluble, you know, cauliflower. Well, we all cauliflower rice and cauliflower flour. We're making a lot from cauliflower, uh, green beans, also nuts. These are all good fibers that can be used very well on a ketogenic diet, right? And then, as I said, now chicory root is one of these prebiotics. You know where you can get chicory root? If you ever get any of the fake coffees, like Cafex or Roma or Ticino, uh, they're all going to add chicory because it has a slightly bitter taste, but it's a very good prebiotic for your microbiome. So dietary diversity, we're trying then to get in not the same foods every day. You've got to, that's just, whenever we're on any kind of, say, restricted diet, uh, even though it's a good diet and there's so many ways that we can, we can make, you know, pancakes and we can make meals and bread and whatever, keto-wise, but we just got to work on getting that variety in, right? And eat different types of protein, uh, all within the keto, have some fish, have some eggs, have some nuts, have some meat, have some, even differences between, uh, like, you know, I was chair of nutrition at the naturopathic school, and I used to teach my students that there's really just two main proteins in America, which is chicken and cheese. And if you, you know, and I do diet diaries with people, and it is amazing. You know, lunch, supper, chicken, 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 you know, it's just amazing to me, right? So different proteins literally will be slightly different to the microbiome, right? Uh, and then just not only trying to get different vegetables in, that whole variety of the lower carb vegetables that are acceptable, but also getting the fermented ones in, getting a little sauerkraut or dill pickles, kimchi. These are, uh, from, these are already fermented and can be used um, uh, just to help already. They have microbiome, they have bacteria already there to expand your own gut. So here's also some other high fiber ketogenic foods, right? So, you know, now blackberry and raspberry, okay, you know, that's towing the line, right? How many are you having? Are you eating any other carbs? So uh, some people can do a little bit uh, you know, berries at least are the lowest carb food with the highest antioxidants. Some of you may not be doing those. Some of you may have a few here and there. Okay. But the leafy greens, avocado, and remember, the, you know, that's, these are all just easy protein, you know, easy foods for the diet. Good, good fiber. So these are low fiber. They're part of the ketogenic diet. They really help people be healthy. But you can't rely on them saying, well, this is really awesome for my microbiome, right? So with the ketogenic diet, we need to be on that diet. We love that diet. We're so healthy on that diet. We're seeing such positive changes on that diet. But, right, we now know it may be that every day, you know, aside from eating some of these vegetables or avocados, I mean, it's, this, is, this is Southwest, right? God, who doesn't love avocados, right? So, um, but also just taking, you know, having two to four tablespoons every day of ground flax seed, chia seeds, psyllium husk, oat bran, just adding fiber into your salad, adding it into your recipes, adding it in so that when you're eating, you're just getting this extra fiber into your system, right? So this is, um, I guess that's, uh, that's what I had to say. Keep doing the diet, but now maybe you've got a little more understanding of your gut and how to keep everything healthy inside your gut and in the whole rest of your body. Thank you.